following is a presentation of Learfield IMG College. From the Georgia Southern Sports Network, powered by Learfield IMG College. Wings up, Eagle Nation! Touchdown, Georgia Southern! This is Inside Eagle Nation, your all-access look into Eagle Athletics. Take a look through all the other action in Georgia Southern Athletics this past week. A lot of road action. A lot of teams hitting the old I-16 out of town. Getting on the steel horse and taking us to parts north, south, west, wherever. Can't really go too much farther east. Now let's return to the Learfield IMG College Studios. Here are your hosts, Colin Lacey and Danny Reed. That's a fact, Jack. Welcome into another edition of Inside Eagle Nation, your all-access look and official podcast for Georgia Southern Athletics. Colin Lacey alongside the voice of the Eagles, Danny Reed. We will get to your travels a little bit later in this week's edition of Inside Eagle Nation. Got it all packed, ready to roll. Tomorrow, you and Daryl Lynn head out, out west, far west. I guess what? not... Well, let's just say we're getting there in terms of the packing. <laughs> There's a general area of the room okay. that's dedicated to packing, but we're not quite packed. Okay. It's 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 present tense. It's not past tense. You're close enough. Yeah, it's close. You're enough. in the direction. Yeah. Where, where are you headed? <laughs> going out to Flagstaff for a couple of days, going to go through Sedona, and then spending a couple of days in the Grand Canyon. Okay. okay. We got our special guest today, Glenn Hart, the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Student Athlete Development. Appreciate you joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. A big part of what you do is the Apex program here at Georgia Southern. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago with Jared. And for those of you watching on Facebook Live, you can get your questions about the Apex program or anything you need from Glenn on Facebook Live or tweet us at GS Sports Network. But this is a program that has been a part for Georgia Southern. It's had a couple of different names over right. the last few years, mm -hmm. but really has taken off this year for Georgia Southern. What's been the biggest growth that you've seen for this program? Well, basically, the program started off um, EIT, Eagles in Transition, and basically, I guess the biggest thing to contribute to, I think, would be you know Jarrett's arrival to to Statesboro. I mean, with his presence and what he has, has done for the the program, the athletic program in a, in a whole, he's just kind of put on steroids, so to speak, if you, if you can say that. Um, he's a firm believer in student development and it, life after athletics, and so he's really behind his program. That's really helped tremendously. And then also having a um, two-part role with Tracy Ham, kind of spearheading the actual job search side, it's really helped broaden the, the horizons. So we're very excited about it. For having somebody specific, specifically like Tracy that's been here since 1982, so we're coming up on 40 years now. Yeah. All that experience, getting to know people in this community, not just Eagle Nation, but Statesboro, Bullock County, Southeast Georgia, mm -hmm. from that standpoint, how beneficial is his presence for a program like this? It is tremendous. I mean, you know, when I first got here, of course, you, you can't help but hear the name Tracy Hammond and you see his picture and his name on the side of the building. So, you know, he's, a, he's an icon here, but he opened so many doors when we go out in the community for different events. As soon as you, you mentioned, you know, Tracy Ham, his involvement, people automatically want to get near him and want because he's very engaging and his name just kind of brings people gravitate to him. So it's helped the program and it helps from a credibility standpoint, too. I mean, because the student athletes, you know, they know his, his past, his history. They know what he's done here. So when he speaks, you know, they, they really listen. It's good to have him on board as well. So. We're going to talk about the big points for what the Apex program has really been about the last few years. But the thing that I think kind of gets lost in translation a lot, this is something from the time student athletes step on campus, their freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, fifth years even, mm -hmm. all the way through their time here at Georgia Southern, Apex affects them in a certain way. That's correct. It's a full four-year program um, from their freshman through their senior year. And a lot of times we talk to students that they think, well, my God, just more classes. How am I going to have time <laughs> to do all this with my, my training, class, my studies, weightlifting, film sessions, playing my games? Now you want me to learn about different things. Well, like I said, it's a four-year program, so basically two times a semester they will be involved in programming a 50-minute session that will give them skill sets. So basically by the time through their four years here, they will have experience and when testing in some capacity those different skills that are needed to be successful in life after sport. And Tracy and I like to say it's kind of like a, um, a, a relay race, so to speak. You know, my portion is giving the skill set, the resume building, the networking, the contacts, how to conduct themselves in an interview, how to speak when they meet people for interviews. Then for that point, I pass them on to Tracy, pass the baton, so to speak, and then Tracy takes them for us internships, job search, and get them out in the community for networking and so forth, job opportunities. So 
That's what I think is so cool about this program, and you and I have talked about it. It's kind of molded into what the student athlete is in in that certain part of their life. Because when they get here as freshmen and get here as seniors, right. it's a very different student athlete you're dealing with. As a freshman, you're getting in, trying to transition them into the college world, getting them a resume. Tracy talked about that last Thursday on East right. Georgia's morning show. Of You'd be amazed how many people that – without a program like this, get to a junior and senior and don't even have a resume. That is true. A lot of times, you know, and I'm very passionate about this program and passionate about what I do because I sat in their, their same seat. You know, I don't know what it's like to have played in high school and been successful and then go to college and then, you know, have opportunity for a scholarship and then have opportunity to go professional, then go pro, but basically not, not to the level of Tracy by no means, but <laughs> had the opportunity for um, Canadian football and, you know, it, it, it fell short and just, you know, long story short, my, the team that I was – um, selected to basically folded. I was there for two weeks, team folded. My rights were basically gone. So at that point, what do I do? So luckily I had people in my in my corner, my parents, people back in my school at Wake Forest University, they basically were like, hey, you're going to start playing at some point. So what are you going to do then? So I try to give that same message to student athletes, try to help them realize you're going to start playing at some point. Because as freshmen, they come in, they're wide-eyed, you know, their concerns about, am I going to play? Does coach like me? You know, where's my next class? And let's just be honest, you know, a lot of them like my boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it may be. But at some point, you realize you're going to be a senior. You, that, that last game, that last hurrah, that last basket, you know, you get that senior jersey, you walk off, and now it's the real world. And the real world is, is just that. It's, it's real. And at that point, no one's telling you, hey, get on the bus for practice. Let's lift weights. You know, um, the, the bus lead at this time, lunch is at this time, dinner. You're in the real world. Nobody's telling you, hey, get up and go to work. You know, make sure you do your job, pay your bills, pay your tax. You might want to be to work on time, you know, those types of things. <laughs> so we teach them all that during this program. And it's just amazing, like I said, with, with Jared and him being here, what he has done to accelerate the program because we it's growing right in front of our eyes. You know, um, we did two things, um, new things this year that we're very excited about. Um, we sent four student athletes on to a um, Eagles Worldwide um, tour. Um, we, as a matter of fact, we sent three to Ireland, and one's going to Paris, leaving on Wednesday. And basically, it's a very rigorous process. So they don't just sign up and just go write an essay. They have to actually interview in front of senior staff, certain GPA, community service hours. So they've got to meet certain criteria for the um, actual um, study abroad. And then at that point, they basically go overseas, have that experience. And the whole point is not just go overseas, but what can you do? How can you come back and be a better person and lead your team in a better aspect? And then another thing that we're very excited about is a career tour. We did one to Atlanta this past spring. You know, you kind of look at it. You know, Bowser School, which had this opportunity, where basically we sent 22 student athletes to Atlanta for the weekend, went to a Braves baseball game, had a networking event, had a dinner um, at Mojave's basically with um, – Miguel, one of our uh, alumni football, they basically um, toured the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I can't say no. She, she'll be very upset if I say <laughs> Dome Stadium. Um, so we're very thankful for their support. But just to see their eyes open up and realize that it's more than just playing a sport. There's a whole world out there that I've got to be experienced. And this program gives them the opportunity. And I think for me personally, I, I, I want to help every single one of them. I find myself, and so does Trace a lot of times, you want all of them to listen, to buy in. But you realize not everybody really wants it. So you get one of those two or three kids, it changes their lives. They, they come back and tell you, Mr. Glenn, Mr. Tracy, I appreciate what you did. Hey, I'm now working at so-and-so. That's when we know we're reaching them. So that's, that's the end goal is to help them transition. So Two unintended wrinkles that life has thrown at all of us mm -hmm. these last couple of years. How do we deal with COVID and now yes. with specifically college athletes? Yes. It's NIL. We're almost a year into that now. Yes. So from what you're trying to get across, how those two factored in? Oh, COVID. <laughs> I, I, where do you start? <laughs> COVID, I mean, it, it. I've never seen anything to touch basically every aspect of, of life. I mean, it, 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 was, it was amazing. And, you know, it hit us hard as well because the majority of what we do is face-to-face, in-person contact, how to deal with people, how to interact. And now we have to go back to a situation where, you know, you can't meet, you can't do anything, you really can't get together because of a safety aspect. How do you go about still teaching them and not allow a year or two years to pass? And, you know, these people, the kids that are juniors, they're now seniors, freshmen, are now juniors, and they haven't done anything. So it was all a virtual aspect in which we had virtual classes, Zoom sessions. And like most of the country, you get used to Zooming. It's very easy to sit back at home and prop your feet up and turn on the computer, but you don't get the same 
contact and same relationship that you do when you sit down to cross and talk with somebody. Because, you know, one thing you try to tell them is you're going to have to have conversations in this day and time. Students, not students, not, but students in general, younger generation, it's all about texting. You know, they don't want to have those face to face conversations. So this forces you to deal with other people face to face, learn how to handle adversity, how to conduct yourself, how to speak. So it's, it's forcing them out of their own comfort zone. And Jared speaks all the time and talks about you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's what we're trying to make them understand that, you know, life's not always going to be easy for you, but it's how you persevere, your grit, what do you, how you push through. So You talked about it with the Atlanta career tour that you guys went on. A lot of Georgia Southern alumni, and there's a lot of people across Eagle Nation that will tell you there are so many Eagle alumni that are in powerful positions in businesses. Yes. How much of a factor is that? You look at somebody like a Danette Thornton yes. that helped you guys out with the Mercedes-Benz exactly. Stadium, Miguel Ayub talking about the dinner. Mm-hmm. How important is it for folks that are a part of Eagle Nation being able to contribute to a program like this? It is huge because, you know, we say all the time in the program, it's not what you know, it's, it's who you know. And I take it a step further and say it's, it's who knows you. A lot of times people, I tell students, you can drop all the names you want and say, I know so-and-so, he's director at this particular bank. That's fine and well. But when I reach out to him and ask him about you and he can't say anything positive, you basically hurt your credibility. So we tell them all the time that networking is key. So I think the best thing that Eagle Nation can do is to get involved, those that have businesses, those that have companies, and realize that these student athletes are desiring to get to where you are right now. And there's no better example than to see someone that played football, whatever sport it may be, wearing your same shoes, know what you're going through, had the same you know, issues and pitfalls that you may be experiencing, but look where they are now. And to hear from their advice and wisdom, and the wisdom of the best te- experience of the best teacher. So I think it, it was, it's great to have them get involved. As you're putting this together, and this is still, this is a living, breathing oh, yes. thing, this continues to evolve, but absolutely. how much do you think about when you were a student and how much these things could have benefited you, and how does that make you think about other things that you can add, because that's what you would have wanted to know when you were going through what they're going through? Absolutely, every day, um, and it changes every day. I, I think when I first started doing it, you know, the, the history of the program, um, when it was EIT, it was basically, you know, it was basically me, so to speak. But like I said, having Tracy, it allows us now to focus in different areas. I'm primarily the skills session. He's primarily the job search. So now I can sit back and say, okay, you know, when I was in school, I wish somebody had told me this. I wish somebody had told me about, you know, the proper way to, to interview. Um, you, know, you know, I was growing up as far as financial management. You know, a lot of your parents and they say, take kind of learn on your own. But we actually have bit partners that come in banks, so to speak, that tell you, you know, how to manage your credit, how to keep your credit at a high score checking account, savings account. And I tell this story because it's, 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 to me, it's very funny. We did a financial session just to tell you how the student athletes are. In this day and age, you know, everybody knows about credit cards, debit cards, and, you know, taxes and so forth. You, you would think they would. We did a session where a young man was basically um, doing financial leadership, um, literacy, and we were talking about Uncle Sam and FICA, you know, everything as far as his check. And he was so upset because he could not understand where his money was going. <laughs> You know, he comes down. Who you know? Who's FICA? Why do they keep taking my money? And it's like, okay, so you know, you hear those kind of you laugh, but that's the kind of questions that we get. And it's just, it's just, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So we try to help them and try to teach and make them realize that you know, there's a difference between a debit card and a credit card. And you know, they they learn those things like that. And Sonovus Bank does a tremendous job. Core Credit Union. Um, we got a lot of partners to help us out. Our campus community does a tremendous job as well. You know, career services on campus. They're a huge partner. They help us out as far as, you know, programming and so forth. But as you know, to answer your question further, you know, the fact that I sat in their same seat and, you know, I asked and said to myself, hey, when I create programs, how is that going to benefit student athlete now? What would I wish I would have known when I was sitting in their seat? And then the fact that I'm doing this now, I give them from my personal experiences and then from where I want to make sure that they avoid the pitfalls that I may have experienced. So, You mentioned it earlier how you have to kind of – present it in a way where it's not just oh i've got another class to go to for these student athletes how creative do you guys have to be to be able to have that buy-in that you have this year extremely creative um and that's once again you know we 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 change the the to direct you the program from the standpoint of you know okay here's a finance class you need to go to it you know here's a resume class you go sit and you hear somebody tell you about a resume two page they're like okay whatever you know i know now and once again I know when I was a freshman, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't want to hear about retirement. 
I, I, I'm, I'm trying to play Saturday. You know, this case, am I gonna start and you know, four hundred one k, you know, get a job and you know, call my mom need some money. You know, so that, that's that's what, that's what your mind is thinking. So I I understand that, but at some point you are going to need it. So we have to be very creative. So we've gone to more of a experiential um, aspect to where everything we do now is giving them experiences outside of sitting in the classroom, outside of having someone lecture to them. And that's why they did the Atlanta Career Tour. They could actually sit down and talk and, and go gather out of their surroundings, go to Atlanta. We're actually going to um, Savannah in, in the fall for Career Tour. And we're looking at either going to Jacksonville or Atlanta again um, this coming spring. So, you know, and then we have um, different people come on campus, um, interactive sessions to where they're not just being lectured to. They actually participate in small groups. You know, our financial sessions are not just, hey, this is a, a check. This is a check about how you balance it. They actually play games. We actually give them um, sample jobs and actual sample budgets. Now, okay, you know, you, you pick your job. You got five choices. You pick your job. This is your salary. Everybody's got the same bills. You may make 45. You may make 85. You make 150. Okay, but you got the same bills. And what we find is that a lot of them realize, you know, the more you make, of course, the more they want to buy. They want to get a bigger car. But then they realize, okay, yes, I only make $5,000. I can't get that BMW $800 car pair. It's just not going to work. So, you know, having them give feedback and just, just, you know, hearing it and spinning it back out, be able to, to apply it to real life applications. So, having some of the summer sessions we've seen on mm-hmm. social media, but mm-hmm. also with Focus too, how do those compare to what you try to do during the school year? How do the summer sessions compare? It's, it's pretty much the same thing. I think the thing that we did differently this year with Trace and I did was we wanted to see how can we incorporate and make it easier for them. Once again, being a student athlete, how, how can we make it easier and better utilize their time? Okay. You know, football with their schedule, it's very hard to get them involved in events. And we're looking at um, kind of expand to other teams as well, you know, the basketball, baseball, and so forth, to do them during the summer. Because they're here on campus, they're in summer school, they got a lot, of, not necessarily off time, but basically they're going to class and working out. So they utilize that time. So basically we can get their programming done during the summer. It's pretty much the same concept as what they have learned in the summer. So basically when we get to August, football will have completed their core programming, their core curriculum. So basically they'll have the whole year free, not, not free from the standpoint they don't do anything. They'll do the community service. They'll do declare your major, things of that nature, but they won't have the, the core program because they did it all during the summer. And it's actually more focused. I, we, we've seen really good results from it because they're all there. They're attentive. They don't have to worry sure. about, I just got off the field lifting weights. I'm working out lifting weights. I'm just in the weight room, got something. I'm coming. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm trying to listen to somebody. We get them, you know, for 50 minutes. We're in and we're out. So it's really good. You just brought up Declare Your Major Day, and that's been a big part yes. of this program for really the last couple of years, mm-hmm. ever since Jared came to Statesboro. Talk about what Declare Your Major Day and why there's so much of a big impact on it. Yes, that is one of the staples of our program, Declare Your Major Day. Um, typically, it's done in March, and it's done with all of our sophomores. And the reason for that is because the sophomore year is a very pitiable year as far as you know your career and, and the decision that you make and impact your earnings you know, for the rest of your life. Because at that point, you've declared your major. And what we try to do is not necessarily, hey, I'm going to major in whatever, and you just, there's no thought that goes into it. As a matter of fact, the focus career assessment that you mentioned, Danny, a few minutes ago, all the freshmen took that, and they get to identify their skill sets. What are they good at? Because a lot of times, when they choose their careers, it's what they've seen their parents do, what they feel comfortable doing, all that they see in front of them. So we give them that skill assessment to realize, hey, did you know you're good in math? Your thought being an engineer, architect, I never thought about that. So now they realize, okay, these are where your skills are. This is where you can potentially go for a career. And then we help them fine tune the path to get that route. So, you know, it's extremely beneficial. Um, the first year we did it was at the football stem once again because of COVID. Um, we went to the PAC this year, which I think was a, a much better environment from the standpoint, a little more formal. Got a chance to be more intimate with the student athletes. Um, they actually um, go on stage, they declare their, their name, they tell their name, their major, their sport, and then they also tell what they're going to do with their career. You know, and, and also, you know, your role, your role's role is tremendous, and Daniel does a tremendous job, you know, MCing. And, you know, I always tell them whenever I get things done, I got, got to come to him and get it done. So <laughs> I, I appreciate him on that. He does a tremendous job. But, you know, it just really helps out. And once again, they got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. A lot of them, they, oh my God, I got to go there and speak. But they realize when they see their peers do it, I can do it too. And you're going to have to talk to somebody at some point. So one, it's baby steps. And we start as a freshman doing little things of getting you out of your comfort zone, talking to people, pushing you out of your, your silo. Because when we have events, you know, the team, you gather with your team, you kind of huddle you know, who you feel comfortable with. We make you, you know, you know other people, different teams, get involved other activities, things you wouldn't normally do. So, so it's a really good event. 
how do people, whether it be alumni, former student athletes, how do they get involved with a program like Apex to be able to impact what you guys are doing now and in the future? Um, well, basically, um, you know, they can just contact uh, myself or Tracy, um, you know, if they want to get involved. Actually, on the Apex website, uh, on the actual Eagles, on um, GSEagles.com homepage, they can go on the Apex website. There's a session where they can go in. Um, they can enter their comments, email, and everybody wants to get involved. Um, it's not necessarily money. A lot of times, uh, it, time, conversations, experience, we're looking for networking contacts. Really, you know, anytime we can sit still and we down in front of a business person, who not necessarily an alumnus, but you know, it's good to have an alumnus being the experience where they they've been that offended for Georgia Southern. But you know, experience. Anyone that's you know, we try to pair them with their majors. You know, job shadowing. That's another huge thing. The business leaders that you know, you work in a particular company, and you don't mind, would love to basically take a student athlete under your wing, let them follow you around for a day or two during the summer to get an idea of what it's like to work in that field. You know, a lot of times they say, hey, "I want to be a, you know, a, a technician or whatever, you know, whatever it may be," and they go do that job, and they realize, oh, "I don't think I can see myself doing that all day." <laughs> so you go to the next step, but that's good enough that early, yep. and as opposed to graduating and you get in that field, and you're like. I can't see myself doing this for the rest of my life. So we try to help them realize, you know, what they're good at, what they're passionate about, and, and go from there. So really appreciate what you guys do with this Apex program. It's been a lot of fun to see it transition, yes. no pun intended, from EIT to Apex and everything that it keeps growing with. Appreciate what you and Tracy do and appreciate you joining us tonight. Absolutely. I appreciate you all. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Glenn. All right, thank y'all. Once again, that's Glenn Hart, the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Student Athlete Development. And when you put him and Tracy Ham in a room together talking to student <laughs> athletes, you know you're rocking and rolling with something pretty good. What I love about this program is that this is not an office that a student athlete can go to, pick up a pamphlet, and may or may not have an impact on their college experience and maybe the rest of their lives. This is proactive because they're bringing this to the student athlete and you make it fun and engaging so one it's memorable and in another way you've got prospective student athletes that are coming in thinking that they want to do abc yeah. but with what glenn just talked about with these assessment tests you may find out well i really like xyz a lot more and it takes you down a road that you may not have thought you were going but you like it that much more, and it opens up a life of possibilities that you would have never anticipated. Yeah. One thing, and I got to talk to Tracy a little bit because he came on the morning show over on our flagship station last Thursday to talk about Apex. It's like an Apex week we've yeah. got going on here. <laughs> but the thing that I really like, and Glenn touched on it just a few minutes ago, you start as a freshman, and all of the freshmen are doing the same core curriculum, quote unquote. Sophomores, same deal. Juniors, same deal. Seniors, and it's in the stage of life that they're in. Yeah. We talked about it. Coming in as a freshman to when you're about to go into the workforce as a senior, that's a very different human <laughs> being. <laughs> and what impresses me about how they've had to adjust on the fly with COVID, you're getting fifth and sixth year students now. Yeah. So this is a program that not only has people involved, but they've had to be even more creative to keep student athletes involved and thinking, okay, we've taught this. Can we also show this? Is this going to be able to build on what we've already shown them? And for them, it's a part of discovery for them as they continue to build this program. Can they implement things that may take them down a path that they weren't anticipating? I know one thing. They would have had to get creative a couple of years ago when Ryan Frederick was on his, what, 12th year? Well, with Todd Bradley Glenn <laughs> well, having a true. possible eighth year, because he could come back in 2023 as well, they may need to sit, him and Tracy may need to sit down. <laughs> All right, look, what can we do with this guy? <laughs> We've literally thrown everything. At him. <laughs> but that was that was really good from him, and I know him and Tracy have worked a lot of long hours, a lot of days, a lot of weeks, a lot of months to make this not only a successful program, but something that people look forward to. Yeah, and in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have kind of the flip side of it to talk about apex being a part of an internship program through apex with georgia southern sports properties gonna have izzy coming in a tr track and field student athlete and cross country runner gonna have her coming in in the next couple of weeks to talk about the student athlete side of it of how beneficial is it for the student athletes and what they're able to do but we dive into this week's news and notes in Georgia Southern Athletics. Again, if you've got your questions or comments, you can comment on Facebook Live, tweet us at GS Sports Network. Any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, whatever, we'll take them all. 
But this weekend, Georgia Southern Athletics do have some pretty shocking news and pretty sad news to pass along. Patrick Spurgeon, everybody knew him as Doc Spurgeon, had been affiliated with the Georgia Southern football program for a long, long time, passed away last week. He is somebody that we have heard the stories from Roger so many times of the intricacies of the scouting reports <laughs> and the travel stories that Doc Spurgeon had, being able to go and scout opponents. Because that was back in the day, if you didn't send somebody to your next opponent, you would have no clue what was going on. You know, what floored me about that is looking through some of the old Irk Russell coaches shows, Doc did an ad, a TV ad, really? for the cars that he would drive for the scouting trips. That's awesome. It, you could pull them up on YouTube. They're out there. The first time I saw it, of course, he was dressed in all black because right. that was his thing. That knocked me off my chair to see that. <laughs> that, that was so. That was just a piece of history. That was so awesome been kind of reaffiliated with the program in a couple of different roles the last few years for Georgia Southern football, but definitely somebody, Anthony Beck, put out a pretty touching tweet a couple of days ago when we found out of Doc's passing. But to see the kind of impact that, and you don't think of somebody at Doc's age having that much of an impact, especially in the special teams, but seeing the impact and you and I being out at practice would see Doc roll up in the golf cart every day. Yeah, He'd be out there working with these 21, 22-year-olds every single day. And he was – we had him on the coaches show a couple of years ago. Yeah. Being able to, for him to say being affiliated and being a part of this football program has what has kept him young. And I think I've said it on this podcast before, that segment we had with him in 2019, that's – one of my favorite segments that yeah. we've done with any person or group of people since we started doing these. And from our standpoint, you also spoke of the women's clinic a couple of years ago as well, and you got a standing ovation because that's the only way you were going to honor him after <laughs> the way he spoke that day. But from our standpoint, watching him hold court the way that he did, outside of taking a picture with a cell phone when he took the stage or was about ready to talk, that's the only time phones were out. Yeah, When Doc spoke, Phones go away, eyes open, mouths shut, because he's not only talking about what he went through here, but he did it in such an eloquent way. There's not a whole lot of football coaches that served as English professors. No. And someone that was an outstanding athlete at VMI, at Emory & Henry, a member of that Hall of Fame, was a great linebacker, was known for being great on the field, and of course, great with language. He always had that gift of language with... Of course, wearing the all black, it's from a poem that Christopher Marlowe wrote called Timberlane the Great, where if an army stormed the castle, if they were all black, you were done. That was imminent doom. And that's why he wore it all the time. <laughs> that was his his salute to the literary prowess that he that he possessed and the intellectual prowess that he possessed. But to know that he could combine that with the game of football and present these scouting reports in such a way that they still talk about. And he predicted Shannon Sharp's greatness where everybody else said, ah, come on, I'm telling you, he's going to be in the NFL. He's going to be a Hall of Fame. God, come on. He had over 200 yards receiving that day. Yeah, he was all right. He still has one of the longest plays in the history of Paulson Stadium. That 91-yard catch he had that day against Georgia Southern. That Savannah State team almost beat Georgia Southern that day. But we only got to really know him those last few years when yeah. he got reinvolved with the program, but he was at practice almost every day and you knew it wasn't easy for him to get around at that point, but for him to be involved, to be willing to share the stories, and to garner the amount of respect that he had from everybody. Oh. Players, coaches, fans. And I'm telling you, when he spoke that night at Eagle Creek Brewing Company, you couldn't hear a pin drop for 15 no. minutes. It was remarkable what he shared, and that will always go down as one of the more special things that I think we have done on this network. So, again, our thoughts go out to Doc and his family of his passing last week, but definitely somebody that impacted this program for many, many years in a lot of different ways. But we move on to Georgia Southern Baseball. A couple of news notes to pass along. One coming out this afternoon, and it's one that we have been waiting to pass along for a little <laughs> while now. Cody Wofford, the former volunteer assistant for Georgia Southern Baseball back in the 18 and 19 seasons, coming back to be the hitting coach for Georgia Southern Baseball, and I don't know that we've touched on it yet 
specifically on this podcast, but Alan Beck being moving over to Western Carolina as the head coach, a huge opportunity for Alan and huge congratulations out to Alan and his family. We've talked about it many times. This staff for Georgia Southern baseball was a special staff is a special staff. Alan, a huge part of that huge part of the success that Georgia Southern baseball has had over the last years. And it's hard to believe that Alan had been here as long as he had. I kept thinking, and I guess, Every year you keep saying, oh, he's been here two or three years. Eventually that adds up. But somebody that nobody more deserving than Alan Beck to be the head coach at Western Carolina, his alma mater, had been a part of the staff up there. Huge congratulations to Alan. And if there was anybody that was going to fill the role of (laughs) Alan here in Statesboro, it was going to be Cody Wofford. It's a win-win all around. You hate to be losing Alan but I have a feeling Alan is going to be staying in touch. (laughs) (laughs) We might have him on the week we play Western. Who knows? Okay, I'm in. If we get Western to not cover, who knows? I'm in. But you gain Woff, that's a huge win for this program. We had to wait for one piece of news so we could talk about the other piece of news. We had known about Alan for a couple of weeks now, and he's been back and forth between Cullowee and Statesboro before he officially gets his family up there. And for for Kim, for Easton, for Eli, that is such a great thing for them. We knew that when Bobby Miranda finally retired after 15 years that Alan was probably going to be near the top of that list, and it turned out that he was the list. (laughs) The list stopped at 24. (laughs) And he got here my first year. So from that That's standpoint, right. he his first season was 16. My first baseball season was 16. So I'll always have that unique attachment with him. But getting to know him, our daily visits, whether it was the office right across from Rodney Hennon or the office in the corner of the Wiggins building this past yeah, year. I didn't like that he moved offices. We, we had to adjust our track for our daily Dude, meetings. But it worked we, out. 41 wins later. Yeah, so I don't know what they're going to do now. <laughs> I don't know where Walsh's going to go. But getting to spend those five to ten minutes with him each day talking about what happened the night before the pitchers that we're going to be seeing tonight whether it was the starter or the bullpen because we could we figure okay so they're probably going to go this guy and uh, you know do we pitch hit him here do we i don't i don't know what we're going to do yet but the, the fact that we were able to develop that relationship and how open he was and just i've said this before with rodney how good of a man he is alan's pretty close to the top of that list as well there's no doubt a great human a great family kim salt of the earth easton and eli they're going to be playing professional baseball there's no doubt in my mind he's got some studs now yeah easton's a stud (laughs) but the thing that i loved about alan was you mentioned we go in and i don't know how this happened it just kind of did how we would go in and we'd end up going about 15 minutes early because we knew we were going to stop and talk to Alan for about 15 minutes before we went and talked to Rodney. You knew it was really good when Rodney would come out of his office right. and Alan would say, well, well, y'all ready? <laughs> yeah, he knew we had gone over on the Alan time. <laughs> but the thing that I loved, Alan was the same guy, and again, this is not everywhere, trust me, that it didn't matter if Georgia Southern had gotten beaten 14-1 to and Georgia Southern offense had struck out 27 times. That didn't happen, but you get my point. Or if Georgia Southern had just scored 13 unanswered against Georgia, that did happen. Oh, yes, it did. He was the same person. It didn't matter if Georgia Southern had just gotten their teeth kicked in. Allen was the same dude. Now, he was a little bit more excited after that 13 unanswered. (laughs) But he was still very open, very honest, very welcoming to us. And that is something that when we, (laughs) I love it when we go around the league and talking to different folks and not even around the league, around the country of the different radio crews. And we're like, yeah, we were talking to our hitting coach and they're like, wait, what? (laughs) Your hitting coach talks to you? (laughs) Yeah, man. You want me to call him? I mean, he'll probably come up here real quick. Yeah. I mean, it, it's stuff like that that you realize how special it is. And again, I love that Waff is coming in because he's just going to carry on yeah. that tradition. And like I said, you hate losing Allen, but you realize it's best for him and his family to be able to coach at his alma mater as a head coach, his first time at being a head coach at the D- D1 level. But if you were going to lose Allen, there was only one person that. I think could replace Allen and that's Woff. And that tells you in the little time that he spent here 
as a volunteer, the kind of impact that he had to be at the top of that list to immediately come back. No, no, for sure. You think about it. Think of the Rolodex. And I know nobody uses a Rolodex anymore. But think of the yeah, Rolodex. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, these is, take away the Rolodex. Yeah, this is your Rolodex. <laughs> <laughs> but think of the contacts that Rodney Hennon has in his phone over 25 years of coaching. And you go to somebody that is was your volunteer for two years, and that's your number one and essentially your only call. How much does that say as a volunteer assistant coach? And there's a lot of volunteer assistant coaches across the country that are essentially a another assistant coach that just don't have the title or the money. Waff filled that role and he made such an impact on this program in two years as a volunteer assistant that Rodney Hennon is undoubtedly comfortable with him leading this hitting side now. Yeah, one with Allen. I know one guy that is thrilled for him that's no longer here, and that's B.J. Green. Oh, no I doubt. I cannot tell you how excited B.J. had to be to know that Allen was getting his first opportunity as a head coach because they're as close as could be. They spent the first six of his seasons before B.J. went to go be the pitching coach at UAB this past season. But to know that Woff is the one that's taking over, I've got to make – that makes me think that Allen feels pretty good about that too. Because yeah. if you had to ask Allen who he would have wanted to replace him, it's Woff. Yeah. I'm, I'm just – for Eagle baseball fans that are listening to this or watching this on Facebook Live – this is a really, really good thing. Absolutely. Cody Wofford, you and I have said it many times, and there's a lot of times that we <laughs> we play these weird games in the car when we're driving to random places across the southeast of, okay, if this coach were to be let go or if this job opened, who would fill it? We play that game in three, four years. <laughs> Cody Wofford's name is going to be in that discussion. I guarantee you. He yeah. is somebody that is a little bit under the radar right now, but he is no doubt a rising star in this industry, in this world. Spent the two years as a volunteer assistant after he was out South Alabama as a GA and volunteer type role. Then going on to be the hitting coach at Eastern Kentucky, which was still mind-boggling to me i kept wanting to say western kentucky since that's where he played and graduated from and you know that story yeah he was a part of an exhibition that you called and didn't even know it he you was still a, have the scorebook he was the starting shortstop for the western kentucky hilltoppers in 2015 when they played an exhibition against the bowling green hot rods the year that i was there doing it did not have an idea and <laughs> as soon as he got here i thought okay western you would have been the shortstop that so i went and found my scorebook and the weird thing was both teams hit 10 guys that night. So I have the old Carpenter scorebooks, that big block down the down the side of it where I mean, you could draw the line and give more notes for your pitcher or whatever. That was actually for a hitter. And I think Woff hit 10th that night, but I can't remember. <laughs> so he was in the extra box. Jace Conrad, former Louisiana standout, hit 10th for the, for the hot rods that night. How about that? But a huge congratulations all the way around. Couldn't happen to two better people. Cody Wofford, now the hitting coach for Georgia Southern, and Alan Beck, the new head man himself for the Western Carolina Catamounts. He and Daniel Hooker are going to have a lot of fun. Oh, that's another person that's fired up that he's back on the mountain. Yeah, I'd imagine yeah. so. Hook better be. Mm -hmm. Hook needs to take him to Dairy Queen after <laughs> wins, too. He'll hear in, that story, in too. In a cube. He will hear that story. <laughs> well, one, other, one other news note to pass along to you from Georgia Southern Baseball. It's a a little bit of an update of Georgia Southern Eagles in the pros, but somebody that we haven't heard from necessarily the last couple of years. Spent the last two years on the injured list, but Brian Eichhorn making his return back into professional baseball made three appearances with the Rookie League affiliate of the Cleveland Guardians. Went four innings, two hits, no runs, struck out seven, has made one appearance, with the Lynchburg Hillcats, to make sure they were still the Hillcats, but the single-A Carolina League has made one appearance and an inning in a third. 
just allowing two hits and struck out one. So really good to see Ike back on the mound and continuing his professional career. Just like everybody else in 2020, there was no minor league season because of COVID, so nobody played that year, but he didn't play 2021 either because he was off a Tommy John surgery. He had some other arm issues before that, even though he had done really well in short season ball with Mahoning Valley. Hadn't heard much over the last two years about what his status was. Was he still playing? It was very hush-hush, but as the rehab progressed, he finally got back into it out in Arizona, and to see that he made his return and watching that pop up on social media over the weekend, you hate that you forgot about him still being professional, but that adds another guy that Georgia Southern has that can have a chance to get to the show, and that was a really cool thing to be able to revisit. Over the next couple of weeks, we will catch you up on everybody else in professional baseball. That's a Georgia Southern Eagle alum, but had to pass that one along. Really good to see Brian Eichhorn make his return into professional baseball. Had a big announcement earlier on this afternoon. The 2022 Hall of Fame class announced you're going to have the inductions the weekend of November 4th and 5th, that around the South Alabama football game, but you had... Seven inductees to the Georgia Southern Hall of Fame class. Taz Dixon from football. Alex Marsh from football. Alex Mash from football, rather. The Nelson family as donors. Elizabeth Nito Ciro from women's tennis. Mike Shepard from baseball. Katie Van Dyke from volleyball. And David Young from football. And just to, for a 100,000-foot view of what these folks have accomplished in their playing days for Georgia Southern football. Taz Dixon, an All-American player who left Georgia Southern holding six school records. Alex Mash, a two-time All-American, was the SoCon Defensive Player of the Year in 1993. The Nelson family goes without saying what they have done in the donating millions of dollars toward the athletics projects. Elizabeth Nate O'Serrell, the women's tennis player, most decorated player in the Georgia Southern women's tennis history, who won six Southern Conference titles. Mike Shepard with baseball, three-time first-team all-conference selection, who is still among the all-time leaders in program history. Katie Van Dyke, the only player in Southern Conference volleyball history to earn first-team all-league all four years, and named the league's player of the year in 2012. And then David Young, a two-time All-American for Georgia Southern football with conference championships, four conference championships, and two NCAA, one AA national championships. This is a group that is not the quote-unquote big names of the team, but folks that had huge, huge impacts on what Georgia Southern was in their respective sports. Actually messaged with Shep earlier today when I knew he'd gotten in that that's such a awesome thing for him i had a chance to meet him officially when he came down for coach stalling celebration of life a couple of years ago we we had message back and forth we had him on an edition of where have they flown a few summers ago talking about his career here he told a couple of really good stories about coach stallings but with taz dixon he was the career interceptions leader before rodney oglesby his pick in the 89 championship game set up the game winning field goal to beat stephen f austin Monster Mash is one of the top defensive linemen in school history. Of course, the 93 SOCON Defensive Player of the Year. And that's a long list of great defensive linemen. Go back to the 80s with Coach Payton, the Howland Commandos. But Mash is one of the best that has ever played here. And, of course, with David Young going on to the NFL and playing with the Jacksonville Jaguars for a spell. You saw the picture on social when Jack Del Rio was coaching down there. And then covering a number of other sports. I love when the class is balanced out. Of course, Georgia Southern football was always going to take the headlines just how it is. But to be able to have the class balanced out with a number of sports, that's what makes classes truly special. When you can show the success and the depth of what has happened here, not just at Paulson Stadium. Again, this is normally a two-year rotation. Every two years, you induct a class into the Georgia Southern Athletics Hall of Fame. Over 160 inductees with these seven going in over in November. Last year, you had the induction ceremony for the class of 2020, but because of COVID-19, you couldn't have the induction, so it's back-to-back years with an induction, but this is the 2022 class following the 2020 class. But a huge congratulations again. Taz Dixon from football. Alex Mash from Georgia Southern football. The Nelson family as donors. Elizabeth Nato Serrell from women's tennis. 
Mike Shepard from baseball, Katie Van Dyke from volleyball, and David Young from Georgia Southern football, the newest inductees to the 2022 Hall of Fame class. Again, those inductions will be the 4th and the 5th of November, sandwiched around the South Alabama football game over at Allen E. Paulson. Speaking of Georgia Southern football, added a game with a former SOCON rival, Chattanooga, going to be making their way down to Allen E. Paulson August 30th of 2030. As Frank said, plan accordingly for 2030. Bingo. Bingo. What, what are we going to be doing eight years from now? Playing Chattanooga, uh, apparently. <laughs> Maybe be at, back upstairs. Yeah, we're going to really deck this thing out by 2030. <laughs> Oh, we'll get to a point where it's all holograms. We won't even need the actual stuff. We'll just be able to Google Glass it up there somehow. You know, that's a good point. Or Will pe- we still hang posters? Or oh, it'll be blank, but the people that are watching will be able to mentally just transmit through and say, I want this there, I want that there, so everybody can have their own experience for the podcast. Huh? How about that? All right, you make that work. How about that? Yeah. Got, all right, I got eight years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got eight years to figure that one out. <laughs> make that work. By the time we're talking about and previewing Chattanooga for August 30th of 2030, that needs to happen. That will be my 45th birthday. Huh. That's right. And I bet you Jim Reynolds will still be there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, oh, man. Did have one other thing we needed to touch on before we wrap this edition up of Inside Eagle Nation. We do have a couple of questions in the hopper to get to in just a moment, but had a story coming out from GS Eagles earlier on last week, and Kevin Ellison completing his journey is the title of it, and really good story put out on gseagles.com that after nearly 10 years of arriving in Statesboro, Kevin Ellison... Finishing up his football career a number of years ago, but finishing up his degree and graduating from Georgia Southern just a few days ago, or a few months ago now. This is what it's about. We we love to watch how they perform on the field, but when you get the cap and the gown and you move the tassel from one side to the other, or if you get lucky enough to be able to throw <laughs> throw it up into the sky, that's why that's why you're here. And look, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Yeah. That's a story of commitment, emotional endurance, and stim- simply sticking to it. Look, we, kn- we know what Kevin Ellison did on the field. We know that he was a 3,000, 3,000 guy. I'm looking at the Eagles drain the swamp poster, yeah. and I'm looking at him, and I'm remembering the <laughs> touchdown run that he had in the first half of that game and how Georgia Southern came back from a deficit to win that game 26-20. But I also know that he could have just been happy being a dad. Yeah. He could have just he could have raised his family, but this was something that always stuck out. This was something that he wanted to complete to be able to break that yellow tape to cross the checkered finish line to say, "I did this. Yeah. I finished this part of my life." And the fact that we're able to celebrate this for somebody that did figure it out, somebody that had success, somebody that got to the finish line, and I love this. I love that story. Yeah. Do have a couple of questions on Facebook Live coming in. Bob McKessie, appreciate the questions. Any non-conference women's basketball opponents for the 22-23 campaign? Nothing, nothing has come out officially. Last year was a lot of the return trips, and so that's why you had a lot of road games for women's basketball. Men's basketball kind of had to do the same thing. That's what they've got coming up. Yeah, so... Women's basketball was on the tail end of a lot of contracts, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a number of new faces in the non-conference slate, but none of those have been communicated or none of those have been finalized. And it's probably because a lot of the staff turnover, we talked about it last week with the two new assistant coaches coming in, that'll be on the top of the docket for the two new assistant coaches coming in because Chris Straker handled the scheduling for Georgia Southern women's basketball with him heading out west to San Diego State. Really appreciate what he did, but that was part of his duties, and so now you're going to have to have one of the two new assistants take over the scheduling, but that should be coming out here in the next uh, couple of weeks, months maybe. You know, I think the men are still looking for a game or two, but... 
from past conversations, I think we were having Coach Berg on, we had Coach McAllister on last week. We didn't necessarily talk scheduling. It was more roster construction. But from what we can gather from the games that were played last year, since a lot of those were home and homes, this year a lot of those are going to be return trips. So Georgia Southern is going to have its most non-conference home games in about 30 years. So just plan on that and planning on seeing the Eagles a lot more here November and December instead of having to find a stat broadcaster, an ESPN3 or an ESPN Plus feed, wherever they're going to be traveling. There will be some, but just not as many as past years. Speaking of men's basketball, I was sitting in here getting everything ready for the podcast tonight, earlier on this afternoon, and I kept hearing all the commotion behind the wall, and I'm like, what is going on? Oh, yeah. For those that don't know, behind the wall behind Danny is the practice gym literally right behind this wall yeah and you don't realize how thin those walls are until a basketball goes off of it and then you think the basketball's coming in here but yeah that's why we don't have any pictures <laughs> hung there it's more just <laughs> pin cushion or tape the pictures are oh, not back there but we talked about it with Tim McAllister last week they have camp all week yeah. today through thursday and you knew it was going to be well attended when William Martin and Southern Exchange tweeted out this morning yeah. that the line was forming and it was almost a fair road. 160 campers throughout the week. And that's every day. When I walked through, they had two games going in the front gym. They had two games going in the practice gym. And it was pretty intense. Saw Coach Berg. He was walking by and... I'm like, you good? He goes, day one of camp, 160. <laughs> he said by the time he gets to Wednesday and Thursday, it'll, okay, Friday, Friday, <laughs> Friday, Friday, Friday. <laughs> but a cool thing to be a part of for 160 folks in the Brian Berg basketball camp. And that's ages four all the way up through 18. They have the Little Eagles that Tim talked about last week. I think it's four to six, and then seven to eighteen is the yeah. is the bigger group. The four to six, I think we're in the middle gym, the volleyball practice gym. I think the bottom side of the seven to eighteens were in the main gym today, and then the older folks were in the back in the practice gym today. So if you're driving by Hanner and you see the cars, or you walk into Hanner and you see what's going on, that's what's going on. That's something. If you want a site, come by and just take a look. Very well orchestrated by the Georgia Southern men's basketball staff, but you've got four games going on at one time. That's what you call control chaos. And if you want to add another wrinkle to this, you have the Georgia Southern players, managers, and whatnot coaching different teams so Cade Little, who's a manager for Georgia Southern Basketball, has also been a part of the network as a board op and studio producer. He was coaching a team when I walked by. I told him to tee him up. He walks around with a whiteboard <laughs> a lot anyway. Now he actually gets to write on it instead and of giving it up. they gave him a whistle. Yeah. yeah, they gave him all whistles. Okay. A couple of them had lost theirs by the time I saw them this afternoon. Behave yourselves. <laughs> the Georgia Southern men's basketball camp going on this week. We will have to check in with a couple of folks to make sure everybody made it through by yes. the time we get to Thursday. Yes. But we've teased it. You are about to hop on a plane. Terry asked you earlier to make sure you were flying out to Arizona. I didn't think you craved that much excitement. If we were to drive this, <laughs> we would get there when we are scheduled to come home. Yes. Yes. But yes. But heading out to Arizona, you, you and I have talked, going to the Grand Canyon, trying to catch up with a Diamondbacks game. Going to try to do that tomorrow night, depending on when we get into town. There's a couple of places in, in Flagstaff that we're looking at visiting, and we'll spend a couple of days, I think, in the, she said, the South Rim I didn't realize that there were north and south rims. This is going to be educational. Oh, and, fantastic. But we'll, uh, I'm going to be riding a mule. Really? Into the Grand Canyon this week. You know, it's the same price as the tram. I hope that's not part of the sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I 
but she i think i said this before she went when she was when she was seven years old and she actually found the itinerary this was about a 10-day trip that her and her mom went on and they went to a number of different spots in the southwest and we were looking at doing something like this a couple of years ago but then covid hit right and we had thought that last year things didn't work out but this year would have been the would have been the perfect time. We're actually going to be looking to hook up with some Georgia Southern alums at some point while we're out there. Hopefully that happens. I'll be able to talk about that in some greater detail next week. But I want to also make sure we get to the corner in Winslow, Arizona, because if I'm announcing for the Eagles, I feel like it'd be a disservice to not do that. I mean, yeah. Is it a specific corner? There is a landmark because huh. my buddy's dad actually went to that spot. It was either last year or a couple of years ago. I think Winslow's not terribly far away. The good thing is that all of this is in a nice little radius, and it's going to take some driving, but it's not where you can't get to it. It's right. not where you say, oh, that's 10 hours away. No, you right. can't do that. Very nice. Have fun. I appreciate it. We will get a full recap of all your escapades. Oh, well, hopefully next week. If all travel plans... Well, if I, if, I, if I find Jay Thompson, I may need to wear his 10-gallon hat when I come yes. here next week. Absolutely. <laughs> but hope you guys have fun. Sure. And hopefully everything travels safe. And get back here in time next week. If not, it'll be the following week. And we'll just catch up. And that sounds like it would be a better story. You might hear the term jet lag next week. <laughs> I'm not saying anything, but I'm saying... Uh, no, this, this is a once-in-a-lifetime deal. I can't wait to get out there. Until next week, for the voice of the Eagles, Danny Reed, this is Colin Lacey saying so long, everybody. You've been listening to Inside Eagle Nation, powered by Learfield, the official podcast of Georgia Southern Athletics.